Walker's going to come up here and share a little bit with us about how Quiet Light is supporting brands in selling and some of the things you need to know about selling your business. Give it up for Walker Diebel, ladies and gentlemen. I want to scream and shout. Thank you. Yep. Is this the clicker? All right. That's the clicker. Hey, guys. Um, whoops. I'm not on title slide. Can I? Can you hook me up on title slide, please? Um, so I, I really hesitated to talk about this. Um, thank you. And um, especially after yesterday, because after I heard Charles and Brett talk, I was like, you know, no, none of us should sell our business. We should all like fucking double down on Facebook ads and YouTube and go crush, right? And so I'm not going to talk about this. But, but um, the thing is, is we spend a lot of time thinking about the things that we have control of and the things that we can do in our business to grow and perform, right? However, there are other things external to us that are going on in the world that directly impacts us, okay? And as someone that has been through... Um, a couple of recessions, uh, it seemed important to bring up what is going on here. I literally can't figure this out. Got it. My name is Walker Diable. <laughs> um, first and foremost, I'm an entrepreneur, right? So I am obsessed with the private capital markets and I help people exit, but uh, everyone at Quiet Light is an entrepreneur first. Everyone on our team. Uh, has started companies, has sometimes raised capital, has sold their own companies, acquired companies, okay? That's, I think, the little thing that makes the big difference with us, right? And um, uh, I saw Garrett speak in 2018, by the way, when he was like, you know, up and coming and his business was thriving. I thought it was interesting what they just said. I've got, um, uh, I've got, uh, this is total, total aside, but I have a business right now that, like, the last six years, I've gotten it to about three, 3.2 million, okay, in revenue. And it's one of these where, it, you know, I've had it for, like, seven years, and I now have a verbal offer to sell it. And this is not my $20 million exit, but it's my fourth seven-figure exit, right? And so, so it's just a different way, right? So I've had a number of, of smaller exits like that, which is awesome. Um, but, uh, you know, I've, I've coached, uh, consulted, advised on over 100 transactions. Um, and uh, everything from sub hundred thousand dollar transactions all the way up to 180 million. Um, you know, I'm an investor. I've got all these things. And th again, the headline: like, I've been through two recessions, right? There's other people in this room that have been in these recessions also. Okay, but I'm starting to figure out. I'm 46. Okay, and I'm, I was talking to a guy yesterday in this room, maybe Jared, and then and I realized he's like 26, and I thought that I was the same age as him. And this is common, right? Like I'm starting to figure out like, wait a minute, there are so many entrepreneurs that don't even know what's going on and they don't know how to read the water. Oh, I wrote this book. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time buying existing companies and so uh, uh, I wrote a book called Buy Then Build and if you have interest in figuring out how an acquisition strategy to grow your company, um, this is the best book my mother has ever uh, read. So I recommend you do too. Um, so here's the deal. The first time uh, that I got the pleasure to speak at Blue Ribbon was in uh, Denver in October, and we talked about buying businesses and, the, and paying attention to the life cycle of the business itself and figuring out the different profiles of buyers that buy at different places, okay, and when you can buy, all right? And then last time, we talked about the M&A market cycle and how the M&A market cycle impacts us and moves like a sine wave through time, right? And how um, uh, th this last positive M&A cycle is the first time that online-based businesses had, were, were mature enough to participate in it, okay? So it did occur to me that by talking about the economic cycle this time, maybe I'm making sort of like a trilogy you know, and although we all like the original Star Wars and Empire is everyone's favorite, this one, you know, it might have, it might have Jabba, right? It's cool, right? So what are we going to cover? Mink. We, we've got why is the market changing, all right? Um, where are we in the market cycle? Can I still sell? Um, spoiler alert, yes, you can. Is Craig in here? He's not in the room right now. Okay. But Andrew him. is, part business partner. Raise your hand, Andrew. Andrew. All right. Are you guys buying right now? Buying. You can, you can still sell. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, we're going to talk about different buyers, um, how to prepare mentally, logistically, what to expect, what can go wrong, expect the unexpected, uh, benefits of an advisor, how to get started. That's a lot. This is more than a 30-minute um, presentation, so I'm going to be skipping things as we jump through, okay? Uh, but first, why do I care? Why do we even care about any of this? And the thing is, is Garrett actually teed us up perfectly, okay? Because your business, okay, you will not die with your business. Please don't. Okay, you're going to exit at some point, and the data shows that 50% of all financial benefit that you will get from your business will be the day that you sell it. Okay, so it's critically important. Okay, and the thing is, is when we look at the stock market, right, every single day there's buying and selling, so we have a stock price all the time. But with our business, you know, someone like Garrett. Someone like Ezra, you know, you might get a couple of bites of the apple. For most of us, it's one transaction, right? For most of us, it's one transaction. And so having that exit strategy helps keep you on pace. So in, in the year 2000, um, I became a stockbroker uh, at Charles Schwab, okay? And it was the tail end of the tech boom, and Charles Schwab hired 6,000 people coming out of college. Uh, my undergrad degree was in English and Religious Studies and I became a stockbroker, okay? And I knew I wanted to go into business, it was okay. But, but the point is, is, is like, um, it was, it was, it was, I got licensed by the SEC and then they immediately moved me into receiving margin calls, okay? So the, there was a boom and now we were in the bust, right? The dot-com bust was on and it was happening. Um, that was terrible. Okay, it was terrible, but I was young. I you know, went to Mexico for a week, it was cool. Went and it was hard to get another job, try to start a business, there was no money, whatever. So I then, you know, by 2007, I had acquired my first company. It was this $8 million book printing business, and we're running it, and um, I bought a, a, a condo because I thought that I wasn't gonna be able to afford a house because the home prices kept going up, right? What happened, right? So during that bust, I ended up uh, lay, ha, laying off people in my printing company. We ended up doing furloughs, okay? Everyone, customers stopped spending money, okay? It was fucking terrible, fucking terrible. And the point is, is during the dot-com boom, you can't even think that this is gonna happen, right? During the housing boom, it just, it doesn't, it just seems like, yeah, something like that could happen, but like, it's not gonna happen soon. It's not gonna happen to us. It's fucking terrible, right? If you are in this room, the odds that if you were publicly listed, you would be listed on the NASDAQ are really high, right? We all have tech companies. Here's the one year performance of the NASDAQ. How does this impact us, right? You might say, well, that's, that's great, but you know, I sell on, on Amazon. Or you might say, well, it, you know, I stay away from Amazon. I sell on Shopify, <laughs> okay? Um, I don't have notes, so I forgot what this one was. Yeah, I advertise on Facebook. I advertise on YouTube, <laughs> right? Okay, fuck it, let's put all our money in Bitcoin. <laughs> There's things happening, right? There's things happening here. So, why is the market changing? All right, so we've got last year, okay, we had a flood of cash coming in, okay? And a bunch of people were raising a bunch of money, and we had a lot of people chasing too few deals, all right? And so what happens is that it floods the, it floods the market with all of this extra cash. So this is, this is quantitative easing at its best, people, right? This is all of the money that was printed. We all had stimmies in our bank account. We're at home buying shit on Amazon. Like this, you know, people are raising $12 billion to go roll up these companies, right? And then, of course, there weren't enough, right? And so you ended up getting all of this, all of this cash moving into the market. And it creates this, this mental state, okay? This euphoric state. And this euphoric state brings in these marginal buyers. And what I mean by marginal buyers is not like, hey, this person is marginal. It's, it's hey, I, you know, we're used to getting like, say, three, four offers on a deal, and all of a sudden we're getting seven of 14, right? What happens? Someone calls you and says, look, seriously, like, like what the hell do I need to do to get this deal? Like, what's the number, right? What happens, right? So that's what was going on. It also happened in the real estate industry, 
right? I mean, there was houses that you know I was looking to, I was looking to buy, and now the the price it's like two streets over my from my house. We just we need a new bedroom. I have too many kids, and you know, it, like now all of a sudden the prices are are um, double what they were like 18 months ago. We've all seen this, right? And so just yesterday, <clears throat> this guy John. Burns, I don't even know who that is. I just picked one of these headlines to be like, look, I mean, people are starting to say like, hey, 16 of the 20 signs of a housing market bubble are flashing red, right? Okay, okay. <clears throat> so those marginal buyers were also doing that in the real estate market. So some deals didn't work, right? So a bunch of aggregators, let's use FBA aggregators as an example, okay? All right, I was doing deals with a bunch of aggregators and all of a sudden, deals stopped closing. Right? We're under contract, you know, we're 90 days in, diligence is going fine, and all of a sudden people were backing out, and it was multiple aggregators all at once, and all of the reasons felt like kind of pinning the tail on the donkey. Right? It was like, wait a minute, that's, that's bullshit. That's not a real reason. Okay? And so, um, you know, again, like, like, the good news is that it's not, it's not gone yet, right? I mean, we still, are we still getting like $2 billion inserted into this aggregator marketplace? People are still buying. Things are still happening. Okay, the sentiment is starting to change. This results in credit tightening. So a lot of the aggregators, as our, as our example here, are um, the reason they weren't being able to close on deals is because the performance of their portfolio was starting to decline internally. And what happened was that as they went from venture capital uh, investors, let's just say on the, on the west coast, to sort of like debt investors on the east coast, those debt investors were getting seats at the, um, at the decision committee, okay, at the investment committee level, okay? And they were shooting down deals at the last minute, all right? And, you know, we talked, Garrett talked a minute about, like, how excruciatingly exhausting it is to go through one of these processes, right? And so it's, it, it got pretty ugly there for a minute. You know, I'm, I'm not picking on... Thrasio, they're just sort of synonymous with this, with this space, okay? And I'm not saying that their credit tightened, I don't know, but they're not buying, okay? And they, they, they were sort of like the, the biggest player. Well, they were the loudest, right? Um, interest rates are rising as a result, right? So we have this quantitative easing, we print all this money, we flood the market, and then we go, oh shit, that causes inflation. So we start tightening credit, right? We start raising interest rates, and, and you know, here's, here's our interest rate chart, and you know, the thing is, is there seems to be a delay going on, right? Like, you can disagree with me, but I don't really understand how we like print, you know, like like 25 to 30 percent of all new dollars in circulation one year, and then 24 months later we raise interest rates a few times, and like inflation's settled. I don't, I, like, I don't get it. Maybe I'm just, you know, I just don't understand. So, here's the part with the economic cycle. Okay, maybe this won't happen again. Maybe it won't, okay? But if history is any guide, all right, you end up with optimism at the beginning, right? You're in a bull market, things are like starting to pick up steam, everyone's starting to get really optimistic, okay? Um, it moves to enthusiasm. Times are good, we are flying, things are selling, we're moving, like we're growing, everything's awesome. I'm talking to my friends, their businesses are awesome, like we're going on vacation this year, right? I'm buying a Tesla. Um, you know, and then what happens is, is this enthusiasm part, what happens is this. The banks get together for their annual retreat in Hawaii, okay? And they're like, God, we just had the best year ever, right? And they're flaring up cigars like last night. And I was blazing that cigar. <laughs> this, this presentation was much clearer yesterday. But, but so, so, um, so they're, and they're like, okay, God, we said the best year ever. Like, how do we improve next year? Like, how do we make more money, right? And then some guy in the back says, um, uh, Miss, what we can do is um, uh, remove all the requirements. So if you need an income requirement in order to get a certain mortgage, we can remove the requirement. And we'll give more, mar more mortgages out. Oh my God, euphoria, okay? Euphoria. Then things start to not quite execute as we thought, right? And you move into this anxiety, followed by denial, fear, everyone's panicking. I'm so sorry guys, this is super dark. Capitulation, 
capitulation. Everyone throws in the towel. And it's at that moment that certain people that maybe have a lot of money or whatever start buying up assets. And they're like, oh man, we're at the bottom, right? And the bull market starts all over again. You get hopeful, cautiously hopeful, and eventually optimistic, okay? I don't know, but I'm gonna guess that that was 2021. Based on the private capital markets, based on the public markets, okay, this is where that was. So, where do you guys think we are now? What do you think? Fear? Okay, uh, my colleague Jason said to me yesterday he thought we were at fear. I think that we're here. I don't know, okay, I don't know, but what I see is that everyone's really kind of anxious, right? We're anxious. When we were trying to sell companies in January and February of this year, it was crickets. I mean, we were putting out great businesses for sale and no one, like, I mean, like, like people were downloading the things, but there was no calls, there was no, nothing was happening. It was really eerie, okay? And then all of a sudden, March started, and in our business, we, and we do about 100 transactions a year, right? I mean, this is statistically significant rhythms, right? And so, like, we started seeing people coming back, okay? And that's why I think it, we're sort of entering denial. Because I'm watching the market start to, Andrew, buy, right? We're buying again, we're buying again. We were, we were scared for a second, but now we're cool, right? Now it's cool. Okay, here's the big thing. The sentiment and the data are different. And that's, that's sort of the big headline that I've got for you today. That's the thing. Like, if you take one thing away, that's the thing to take away. The data that we have and the sentiment that we're feeling are very different. There's a gap. So Quiet Light's first half sales were 50% above last year, and we couldn't get any attention in January and February. That's interesting. Um, there's less cash at closing, so deal terms are getting a little, a little out of whack. Okay, Multiples are very slightly down, very slightly down. Um, I, you know, I don't even want to say the number because I don't want it to give meaning because it's not really meaningful. Um, and buyer sentiment is more sober. In other words, transactions are happening. We're not getting seven to 14 offers anymore. We're getting like, you know, three, four, two, right? And, and a lot of them are saying like, oh, you're under offer. Okay, well just, you know, let me know if that doesn't work out and come on back, okay? A year ago, they'd say, come on, what's the number? What, what do I need to do, right? Um, so here's some metrics. So, so total deal value, uh, this is as of yesterday. It's, it's the trailing 12 months at Quiet Light. This is inside data for real. Uh, over the prior 12 months, our total deal value is up 20%. Okay? Um, number of transactions, zero change. Exactly the same number of transactions as a year ago. Right? Okay? Aggregator deals, 24% uh, of all of our deals were purchased by aggregators, which was down about 14%, okay? That's a lot. They were really big last year, weren't they? They were very, very loud, right? Um, time to close is up about, you know, 7.5%. Value, valuations, uh, I used the wrong word here. It should be like, you know, average deal am amount, okay? So, so the people that have, and, and this is how I give meaning to this last one, is the people that have created a little bit more value are the ones exiting right now, right? They're like, hey, I think I'm, I think, you know, I think, I think we've got enough value. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and cash in and sort of move on and do something else, right? Is this helpful? Oh, thank you. Good. So, so, all right, who's buying? So here's the thing: aggregators, okay, are private equity firms. Last year they were very loud, weren't they? Very loud. We have tens of thousands of buyers just on our list, okay? And aggregators are like a hundred, maybe. Maybe, there, maybe, you know, maybe they have multiple people or 300, you know? There's not that many aggregators. They're just very loud in our space, okay? So, you know, when I wrote Buy Then Build, you know, like, you know, I bought almost 20 million in revenue just by, just by using SBA loans, right? And I was able to, like, grow my business just by buying all these different companies, right? So SBA buyers are very, very real, okay? And if you're buying a company, you know, anywhere under, say, seven and a half million dollars, there's entrepreneurs out there, including everyone in this room, Okay, I can get you up to 90% leverage to buy one of these companies. Okay, it's a great way to grow your business, right? Um, 
uh, maybe wait, <laughs> maybe wait a few months. Um, but you know, yeah, I think uh, so. You know, we'll see what happens. But but then you've got private equity firms, obviously, right? And we all like to think that private equity firms are like the easiest to work with and all the rest of it. Um, that's sometimes true. That's sometimes true. Um, it's also uh, they've got they've got their own they've got their own problems. They're professional buyers, right? But they have they they tend to have a lot of the money teed up, right? Um, Aggregators we talked about, and, and private equity firms, you know, so aggregators are, are firms, but we also have other private equity firms, by the way, folks, that like are not aggregators that are buying companies, right? Um, and then you've got um, individuals with cash. So this could be like, you know, Ezra, right? He's an individual with cash in a fucking sweet car, right? And um, I bought a Tesla Model S Plaid, and it looks like the cheaper one, so like it, I don't get that attention, I don't have that problem you do, but a little bit. Uh, so anyway, so it's it's like uh, um, these are people that have had an exit already, right? Usually, or or they're or they're um, you know professionals that that just have have a lot of a lot of cash, or Garrett's kids, right? You know, uh, so search funds is you know it's kind of a weird word. Uh, you really have to understand this. Like, the, and there's sort of different kinds. Like, there's self-funded, there's traditional, um, there's single sponsor search funds, there's independent sponsors. This can look a lot of different ways, right? So. When I got the $180 million business under contract, it was actually to an independent sponsor. And like we were able to pull together the whole team around it in terms of like the debt and the private equity firm that backed it. Former Fortune 500 CEO came in uh, to join the team. Um, and so the, 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 like the, the, the concept here that I just want to share is that like you don't have to sell your business to, to an aggregator. There's so many, different, so many different people out there. And when you look at it, okay, this is lower middle market buyers. Lower middle market can be defined a few different ways. Um, usually it's gonna be, you know, on the low end, people will start it somewhere as low as two. Some will say it doesn't start till 25, okay? Um, it's probably about five million up to maybe 250 million, okay? That's gonna be the pocket where most of us in this room are, I think. Um, so as you can see, like 18% are private equity firms and aggregators would be in there. But even, even when buying like $100 million transactions, I mean, you know, 40% of these are just done by individuals. It's kind of, kind of interesting, right? Um, the other 40 is existing companies. Actually, one more thing on that, one more thing on that. Um, Often, a lot, like, a lot of people will come to me and say, like, hey, I know who's going to buy this company from us, okay, from, from them, right? Like, I want you to take it to this guy over here. And uh, all I can tell you is um, if you're ever talking to a broker and they say, like, oh, I've got, I've got the buyer. I already know who's going to buy this. Or you're, you think to yourself, like, oh, I know who should buy this. I know who's going to buy it. You're both wrong, okay? That's not who's going to buy it at all, all right? Just the thing is, is like, let me give you a quick example. Um, I had a deal. So Build-A-Bear is in St. Louis. Okay, it's a St. Louis-based company. That's where I am. Um, I've met the, the CEO founder, Maxine Clark, before. She's amazing. Um, I had a business that, they, that would like literally solve their public market downward spiral. Okay, and, and the thing is, is that when you go into these corporations and you're like, hey, I've got this thing. I have like this magic weapon and trust me, you need it. It's not on the list of things that these people are doing for those 90 days. It's just not what they're doing. They take way too long. It's not, it's not, you know, so it's like if you're buying, if you're selling to another company, whoops, this is usually due to um, that company already has an acquisition strategy in place and they're acquiring. That's what's happening there, okay? So just some clarity. It's, it's you know, it's not, it's not who, who you think it's gonna be. Um, so there's, you know, I'll cover these next slides really fast. So, so basically, the, the mental part of selling your business is really the most important, okay? It, this, is, this is like a special project. Like, it takes a lot of work, right? And the big thing is, is like, you know, why are you selling? So in 2021, that was the time when you could say like, well, I guess I'll sell if the price is right. That was last year. That's not really happening right now. A little, like the window's closing and it's pretty clear, but like, but like this isn't where you're like, okay, like, I, like I'd get people on the phone and they'd say, you know, look, I'm, I'm, if I can't sell for at least an 8X, like I'm not selling at all. And I'd be like, okay, like, you know, what's your revenue? And they're like 100,000, 150. And I'm like, okay, never mind. <laughs> no, that's not, that's not, just so you know, that doesn't connect. Um, so, you, you know, that was, that was last year. I, 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 you know, buyers are getting a lot more sober, right, in terms of how they're approaching the market. Um, and there's less of them, right? 
um, you know, shrinking businesses can sell, but it's not, um, it's not ideal, right? Like, so, so we've talked a little bit about, you know, you as an individual, all right, in the, in the past, a, as a seller. We've talked about the M&A cycle, okay, and we're talking now about the economic cycle. It is the rare person that lines up all three. Like, most people get kind of two of them right, but like so many people come and they're like, hey, listen, I'm totally burnt out. Like, you know, I was doing, you know, you know, Ezra talked about, you know, I was doing 100 million, I had 100 million valuation, now I need to sell for nine just because I'm ready, right? And the day that you want to sell, it just shows up. It just shows up. That's usually what happens if you don't have an exit plan, okay? So we can always, we can always get you out, but, you know, you want, it, you want your business to be growing even if it's due to external market conditions, okay? Um, uh, yeah, crickets are excitement. The thing is, is like, if we go to market and we and we get 14 offers in a week, that's that's great. But if you if we go to market and we get crickets, chill out. It doesn't mean anything yet. Like just hang on, <laughs> okay? Like you can have both kind of experiences and they're in there and we'll still succeed in the long run. Um, logistically, uh, okay. Look, I think everyone in this room is is pretty buttoned up in terms of financials. I mean, this is blue ribbon. If if you're not using an accounting system. Please do it now, immediately. Hire a bookkeeper for a few hundred bucks a month and get it done. If you're not in QuickBooks and you're using Excel, get it in, in QuickBooks. Like just if, use accrual, okay? If you don't know the difference between cash and accrual, start using accrual tomorrow, okay? Please, okay? Because it's the right way to tell time and you're gonna start building that history for when that day does come. Um, uh, disclosures, a lot of people are like, oh hey, like, uh, we got all these warts on the business, and, and uh, you know, we probably shouldn't lead with that. I totally disagree. You want to get all that shit out front right away, because when you, when you say, like, here's all the negatives, and here's all the positives, and this is why you want to buy it, because this is a calculated risk, and we're over, we're, this is why you want to buy it, they're like, great. And now guess what comes up later in diligence? Nothing. Nothing, right? So do yourself a favor and talk about all the ugly shit right away, okay? Um, what to expect? Um, okay, look, t like, like, everyone has this dream of like, oh, I'm gonna, like, okay, here's an example. I sold a business for $24 million. W wasn't mine, I was a broker on this deal. And um, uh, there was two partners, and there was an equity role, there was a two-year earn out, the inventory was guaranteed but deferred, there was like, um, let's call it a stability payment, like a, like a hold back, okay? Uh, and then there was the cash at closing, and then of course transaction fees and stuff. And then there was two partners, so they split it. And then after taxes, each of them had about two and a half million dollars in their bank account. They were still like 24 months from getting all of it, okay? But the thing is, is cash at closing is one component, right? And either one of these partners could go to the golf course the next day and say, I just sold my business for 24 mil, right? So you, I just need you, I just want you thinking about like, okay, there's structures that go here. And the more aggressive the valuation of your business is, the more deferred a lot of the comp tends to be. Okay, does that make sense? All right. Um, so this isn't like I'm selling my business for 24 million and I'm getting 24 million on that day. I just want you to have that in your head. Um, talk to your CPA beforehand, um, and then you're gonna come ask me if you can do a stock sale. <sighs> sure, well let's talk about it. Uh, okay, what can go wrong? Guys, ev everything can go wrong, all right? Um, but the, 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 big one, the big one that I want to draw your attention to is falling revenue during the process. If we go out and get, uh, get your business under contract, okay, and, and your, your revenue starts declining, this is really hard, okay? And I'm the best broker in the entire world, I promise you that. But the thing, the thing is, is, that, is that like everyone just starts to think that there's something going on, even if it's like an external thing or there's a hiccup or whatever, okay? And, um, uh, so that's the best thing you could do is be going into this process. What Ezra, Ezra say? I, sell when you're at like 70% of what you think it can do. I love that. Can I steal that? That's like perfect. Thanks, thanks. It's exactly right. And you want to you be coming in, not like when you're exhausted right at the like, oh, I got it, right? Okay. Um, yeah, don't count your money until closing, okay? Because it puts you on a very terrible mental negotiating position, all right? Um, and you may need to restart the process, okay? About a third of the companies I work with, or we work with at Quilight, you know, we need more than one LOI to get there, to get done, all right? Um, and of course, uh, it, it's, not, it's not linear, it's kind of a messy, messy process. 
Um, here's the big thing, all right? I got 50 seconds, so I'm just gonna go right to it. Here's the deal. Um, our metric, internal to Quiet Light, has nothing to do with, you know, how many leads did you get at the conference? Or, or like, how many, how many people signed up to buy a company? Like, it comes in time. Like, we, if there's anything that we have learned, it's that in an M&A cycle, in an M&A process, in the sell, buyer-seller pool, you cannot time when sellers are ready. You cannot time when anyone is ready. Our internal metric is nothing other than meaningful conversations, okay? We are 100% performance-based, okay? And all we wanna do is hang out and talk about this. This is what we do. So like if you, um, so that's sort of like the, the free giveaway. Like if you don't have an exit strategy, there's 14 of us at Quiet Light, like call, call any of us, okay? Um, reach out, go to the website, that's all I got. Give it up Thanks, for Walker Dibel, ladies and gentlemen.